sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13 this morning. Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Two weeks ago we had prayer in James. Last week we had prayer in John. And this week we're going to have prayer in Matthew. Each one is different and yet they all tie together teaching us about prayer, how important it is, helping us to understand why, helping us to realize that uh, we need to pray, the power of prayer, many things. And so may this morning we learn more yet about prayer from Matthew's Gospel in the words of the Lord Jesus himself, because that is what we're looking at this morning. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9, this is what it says. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The words of Jesus teaching us about prayer. Many times this is called the Lord's Prayer, but it is not the Lord's Prayer. We should understand that it is not the Lord's Prayer. We call it that. And yes, I suppose there is some reason for calling it that. I understand that. But it is not the Lord's Prayer. It is the Lord's model prayer. 
It is his teaching us how to pray. It is his giving us to pray like this, after this manner. That's what he said, after this manner. Pray like this. He is teaching us how to pray. He is teaching us about some of the things that we need to incorporate in our prayer life and ministry. It is an example teaching us how to pray, but not the words that we need to pray over and over and over all the time. It's a framework upon which we can build a prayer life, a pattern, if you will, on how we might learn to pray. Should ever prayer be uttered, uttered in just this way, just like this? No, no. Because if we uttered every one of our prayers just like this, we would be amiss. We would be failing in many ways. These are but basics. These are but things that we should incorporate in our prayer life. There are elements which speak to whom we are going to pray, to the faith that we have and to whom we pray, to our trust in to whom that we are going to pray, to our dependence upon whom we look, to our needs which we want to present before he whom we have come to, and to our praise of him in whom we have believed. And our prayers are taken up and offered before him by the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, our Father. God is my Father. As a believer in Jesus Christ, He is your Father. Incorporate together as the congregation of God's people, as Christians all over the world, He is our Father. Our Father. Is He not? Yes. By right of justification, by right of adoption, when we came to that moment in life when we understood that we were sinners in need of forgiveness and we came to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and asked him to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we would proclaim that we would accept him as Savior and Lord of our life. In that moment, God became our Father, our Father. That's what Jesus is emphasizing here. We are praying to our Father. Not mine alone, but to all who bear the name of Christ. To all, no matter where they are, what generation they are, what their circumstances is, it makes no difference. If they are born again in Jesus Christ, God is our Father. If you go back to, to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, you'll see that Jesus is teaching the disciples and he's teaching the multitudes that have come to hear him, come to experience him. This whole passage from 5, 6 and on is the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples and he's teaching the multitudes that have come to hear him about prayer in this particular instance, in these particular verses of Scripture. Part of his teachings are truly a part of the Sermon on the Mount. The God of heaven is the believer's father. The believer's father. That's where he dwells. He is our creator, yes. He is our redeemer, yes. But isn't it much more wonderful and much more precious that we can call him Father. Isn't that word much more comforting, much more uh, a blessing, much more uh, and, and just it, it just brings some warmth into our lives. He's our creator. That's yeah, he is. Yes, and he's our redeemer. Yes, but when he becomes our Father as well, that intimate joyous relationship that we have with God in fellowship. Coming to Him in prayer. 
acknowledges him as the source of our power, as the source of our blessings. Our Father, which art in heaven, who art in heaven, whichever way you read that. In Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, I knew a man once who experienced rising to the third heaven. Are there three heavens? If there are three, do you have a particular one you want to go to? Well, in the mind of man, the first heaven is usually described as the atmosphere above the earth. The second heaven is described as that realm out there where the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, and all those things abide. And beyond that, the third heaven is where God dwells. Now that may seem a long ways away, folks. But it ought simply to help us to understand and to comprehend that the God whom we worship is sovereign. Distance means nothing to Him. For He is as close as your heartbeat. As close as the whisper of your prayer. Distance means nothing to Him. The Bible says that his eye is upon us, so he has no trouble looking afar to see you and I down here upon this earth. And he hears our prayers, so his hearing, he doesn't need a hearing aid, a cheap one or the most expensive one. His hearing is unencumbered. Where is heaven, someone may ask. If I got a global map, a universal map. Preacher, could you put your finger on heaven and show me where it's at? No, I cannot. I cannot. But I don't waste my time worrying about it either. You see, God says in His Word, it's there. It's where He dwells. It's where His throne is. It's where He resides. I don't have any, I don't have any trouble acknowledging that it's there. Wherever my God is, that's heaven. That's heaven. And I know that one day when I die, I'm going to go there. I know that when the Lord Jesus comes the second time, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to be in the fullness of the presence of God. Heaven is where God is. That's enough. That's enough. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy, righteous be thy name. Our Father God is a righteous God. He is a holy God set apart. He is a just God. You know, we often hear God's name used in different ways and they are unpleasant to the hearing of a believer, are they not? In a cursory language, in a derogatory way, in a flippant way, Jesus said, when you pray to my Father, our Father, we pray, hallowed be thy name. We ought not to use God's name in any other way. There is no place for it to be used any other way in the mind of God. Hallowed means set apart from all others. It means to be righteous. It means to be holy. It means to be honored. It means to be pure. It means to be adored. That's how we should look at our Father. That's how we should uh, uh, hold him in our mind. Hallowed be thy name. It is used to praise God. To acknowledge him as the sovereign God of the universe. So what does he say? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy kingdom come. Do you want the kingdom of God to come? Do you pray for the kingdom of God to come? Do we expect it to come? Are we looking for it to come? Jesus said we should pray for it to come. Thy kingdom come into the hearts of people. Human life. The human beings of this world. Thy kingdom come. When God resides in the presence, in the heart of men and women, young and old, thy kingdom come. The kingdom of God came when we received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but not in its entire fullness. It is yet to come in that entirety, in that fullness altogether. What is he teaching us? He teaches us that we ought to live in expectancy. Thy kingdom come. You listen to the news. You look at your world. You sit on the street corner. You walk through the store. You ever, you ever stop and think, God, I wish your kingdom was here. Mm. What a mess our world is in, is it not? What a tragic, tragic mess. Ever since the time of Adam and Eve's sin, but we can't put the finger on them and say it's all their fault. Because we, we too are sinners. But so many people in the world today do not know God and do not live in expectancy that God is going to come. The kingdom of God is going to come. We, as the children of God, Jesus teaches us to pray in expectancy for the kingdom. To pray with faith, believing that it's more than just a dream, more than just a thought, more than just an expression. Expectancy. <clears throat> Believing that it's real. If it's not real to us, then there's something wrong with our faith. We don't understand, we don't comprehend, or we're unwilling to accept. Pray expectantly. Pray in faith believing. And folks, we ought to pray with excitement. Thy kingdom come. What a day when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness. What a day that's going to be. We won't be excited. We're going to walk around humdrum. Oh, hum. <laughs> we'll probably not make it. That's, that's it. If that's the attitude that we have. Excitement. No more sickness, no more disease, more tears, no more hurt, no more pain, no more death, no more sin. That ought to excite us, hadn't it? Being in the very presence of the fullness of the presence of God, hadn't that ought to excite us? Being with the angels and all the creatures of heaven, shouldn't that excite us? Knowing that Satan has been cast into the lake of fire, shouldn't that excite us? Oh boy, we ought to pray for the kingdom of God. It does not now exist in its fullness, but we ought to pray for it to come. Make the request for the rule and the reign of God over all of his kingdom. And one day that's going to happen. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How is the Father's will done in heaven? The Bible teaches us that everything that goes on in heaven is 100% plus 
agreeable to the will of God. Nothing else happens up there. The saints up there abide in the fullness of the will of God. The angels abide in the sense of the fullness of the will of God. The heavenly creatures up there abide in the fullness of the sense of the will of God. And that old rascal called Satan abides in the fullness of the sense of the will of God. Oh, Satan comes before God. Yes, he does. He might be up there right now trying to point his finger in God's face and say, looky down there, Jerry, or Joe, or Tom, or Susie. But in the presence of God, He's in the will of God. And he can't do anything other than what God permits him to say or to do. He is not above God. He is not omnipotent. How's the Father's will done in heaven? Everything is done according to what he permits. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. If we make that part of our prayer, then we must be submissive to the will of God right now, right here, while we live down here upon this earth. Isn't that what he's teaching? Thy will be done on earth. That's where we walk. That's where we live. Thy will be done. We must be yielded. We must be surrendered. We must be given over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Ought we not? It is an absolute. Not our will. Not somebody else's will. But God's will. And only God's will. How are we going to know what God's will is? It's, it's right here. That's why we're always encouraged to read and to study God's word because it tells us what his will is for life. We are to pray that God's will be done on earth and it's desperately needed, is it not? Desperately needed. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me, give us our daily bread. The daily substance of food, yes. The necessities of life, yes. You remember in the Old Testament while they were on that 40-year walk? Israel cried out for bread. God gave them bread, didn't he? Manna, what's this stuff? <laughs> but it tasted good. But you know what? When God gave them manna, he also gave them a word of instruction. He said, you go out and get enough for today. Don't go out and try to gather up for tomorrow so you can sit in the shade. Get enough for today. Don't gather up for tomorrow. What's he teaching those people? Same thing he's teaching us. Give us this day. Are, are you guaranteed for tomorrow? Absolutely not. We make plans for tomorrow. We make plans for next week. We make plans for next year. I didn't make a mark, did I? <laughs> you know, I have no guarantees of tomorrow. I only have the guarantee of the present moment. Give us this day. We are to live one moment, one day at a time and we may not even make it all the way through this day the appointment that we have with God may be over sometime yet before this day ends so God help us to take one day at a time one day at a time the bread the necessities of life 
sometimes we want the desserts first, huh? Oh, I like dessert. I like cherry pie. I like homemade ice. There's a lot of things I like in the dessert box. But he didn't say pray for desserts. He said, give us this day our daily bread. The substance of things that we necessarily need. Not necessarily what we want or what we desire. God didn't say I'm out to spoil you, although he spoils us with his blessings of abundance all the time. Does he not? We are dependent. Give us this day. We are dependent upon God. Whether we think about it, whether we realize it, whether we accept it or not. Can you add hair to your head? Can you add height to your stature? No. We are dependent. Can you add time to your life? No. We are dependent upon God. Give us this day the necessities of life. And forgive us our debts and as we forgive our debtors. What is debts? Debts is sins. Forgive us our sins. The seeking of forgiveness for our sins. Sins of admission. This is what I have done, God, and I'm sorry that I have done it. Sins of admission. I said something. I thought something. I desired something. I looked wrong with my eyes. I listened with my ears. I did something with my, the sins of admission. And there are the sins of omission. Things that I should have done, but I did not do. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Though forgiven initially, we still have sin in our life, do we not? Yes, we do. When our words and our thoughts and our desires and our actions, even our neglect of duty, doesn't measure up to the will of God, it is sin. And we need to seek the forgiveness of God. We have no right to seek God's blessing if there is sin in our life unless we are willing first to confess that sin and seek His forgiveness and His cleansing from it. As we forgive our debtors, Jesus said forgiveness is based upon forgiveness. God forgives us and because God forgives us, we are to be like God. That is God's will for us. So we are to forgive others, those who sin against us. Anybody ever sin against you? You ever sin against anybody else? Mm. We know what it is, don't we? Forgive those, our debtors. Forgiving is conditional, isn't it? It's conditional. God's forgiveness based upon our forgiveness. So what gives us the right to be unforgiving? What gives us the right to say, I'm not going to forgive when God has forgiven us? Unforgiveness is a sin. Maybe somebody had a bad day. Maybe somebody stepped on their toe. Maybe they got up out of bed on the wrong side. Maybe they are a lonely person and don't want to be bothered. Maybe something else has happened to them today. Forgiving. Brother Danny talked about that in Loving Your Neighbor this morning. Forgiving. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors whether they forgive us or not we need to be forgiven because god has forgiven us if we expect to be forgiven then we must forgive for that is what god's word teaches 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In James chapter 1, verse 13, there's a passage of scripture. You might want to write it down. Lead us not into temptation. Does God lead people into temptation? Does God tempt his children? Absolutely no. No, he does not. James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Lead us not into temptation. God isn't going to lead you or I or any of his children into temptation. He may test us, but he's not going to tempt us. And there is a difference. Lead us not into temptation. To lead a man or a woman, a Christian, a child of God into temptation goes against everything that God stands for. Because God is against sin. And temptation is to yield to sin if we answer the temptation. Temptation is real, isn't it? It's one of Satan's greatest tools. He whispers in your ear. He, he puts a little sparkle in your eye. He brings a little thought up here in your head. Hmm. He has so many ways of using temptation. <coughs> Deliver us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from temptation is a good way to consider that. Pray against being tempted. Pray against the power of temptation. Pray that our Father will give us victory over it when we are tempted of Satan. And thus, if he does, deliver us from evil because that is God's will. He will deliver us from evil, from the evil one. Who is the evil one? That is Satan, isn't it? Deliver us from the evil one. Hmm. Lead us not, deliver us from temptation, and deliver us from evil, the evil one. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, it really doesn't matter who's against us because God is sovereign. There's no one like him, is there? Deliver us from the evil one. He's no match for God. He is for us. So we need God's help. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. All of the armor of God. And then, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It may or may not be in the best old manuscripts. If it's not to be found there, it might have been added. But it is considered a part of the Word of God, whether it was or it wasn't. The kingdom of God. Thine is the kingdom. All of this is God's. He created it. It's His. And He is the ultimate authority. He is the supreme ruler. Thine is the kingdom and the power. There is no power that matches his in this universe. Closest thing to it would be Satan, and Satan doesn't even begin to match the power and the authority of God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. God is glorified through his creative world and through his people. These are words of praise. They're words of thankfulness. They're words of worship. They're words of adoration. They're words of honor. The 
of words to consider for God who has done and is doing and is going yet to do so much for his people. And then he says, Amen. So let it be. So let it be. So be it. I agree with God. If we agree with God, then we're going to strive to live as God calls us to live, are we not? We're going to agree with what God teaches us in His Word. And we're going to try to honor that day by day, moment by moment. The Lord's Prayer, it's the Lord's model prayer. Teaching us yet more about how to incorporate and why we need to incorporate some things in our prayer life how important they are.